Greetings, this is Pillar Nexus Ancient Gladiator with more Pillar Loves Tabletop Games, and I didn't think I'd be doing this, but here we are. Today is Thunder's Edge. An early fantasy flight game of units and terrain and politics and other shit. It's, it is what it is. So, the object of the game is to get as much uh, influence and power uh, before the situation is locked down. Uh, there's two ways to win this game. One is to control Centaur and three other population centers. Um, considering there's only four other population centers in the game, that's going to be difficult. Uh, the other is to have the most influence at the uh, uh, at the end of the game. The game can end with uh, tension maxing out. At which point, that's that's it. Uh, it's going to come down to victory points. To that end, you'll have assorted combat units. To fight your opponents with some nice conventional forces. We've got conventional forces, walkers, menace walkers, obliterators, and our artillery. Uh, the numbers are attack, defense, movement, and cost. It's also possible to add stuff like fortifications and landing areas uh, to places so that you can drop in more units and protect your stuff. Um, also, you got location cards which have various effects that are only usable once per game and then you'll turn them over to their use side uh, locations also get you like defense for that area and resource value um, normally tension kind of increases every turn by two anyway but it's also possible to accomplish these initiative cards which add to the tension. Although in one instance, uh, Summit, um, with three senators of different traits, <clears throat> you can move the tension uh, track back by four. Um, starts at one and ends at 30. So that can be quite a difference. Location cards. Um, so mission, so initiative cards are uh, just part of the mission deck, which also includes alliances, so you can work better work together with people formally. Investments to improve your units. Um, Off-world strength cards because there are three places off the planet of um, planet thunder. Uh, the Juno platform, Mars, and shipping lanes, and having those are can be critical to winning. And finally, there's actions. Just some extra things to do uh, to help you out, mess with your opponents, usual stuff. And also, Senate cards. 
So one one of the parts of this game is the Senate phase, where you will have uh, various cards, including senators. But ultimately, you're trying to collect enough influence in one of these five the bureauc uh, bureaucracy, church, agri union, industry, military, to declare council. It's possible to get um, um, you know, uh, other stuff like planned information leaks, scandal, or ill reputation to affect things. And finally, there's the faction cards. Um, notably, the even though the game has like five different colors, um, the colors are not locked to the factions. So your faction is separate from your color, which is nice. So yeah, we got like the Society of the Crown, Pencil, Mercantile Alliance, um, New London Combine, which will actually take the New London tile. Uh, the Obsidian League and the Temple Order are the five major factions fighting for control of this situation because, holy crap, things have gotten out of control. At the start, alright, so actually starting the game. Oh, and dice. Lots of. The game only. Uh, the original game only comes with like four little D6s, so I bought some chocolate dice for this because it needs it. Uh, so actually setting up the game, uh, each player will get their counters, um, one mission card, and three senate cards, and, a fa and their faction card. Yeah. So actually building the map is kind of interesting. Um, so map tiles include terrain. Such as clear, badlands, mountain, and volcanic. And then everything but volcanic has locations. Um, locations cannot have uh, landing areas, areas built on them. Um, in general, uh, moving between things. This is one, this is, and this is one, and then this is one. Yeah, actually building the map. Uh, Centaur and is located placed in the middle. Four random hexes are placed face down um, to kind of create the this this one row that nobody gets to, to know about until they actually discover. And then, um, the players roll off and, uh, the highest roller deals out the remaining hexes. I do the different number, uh, the number of hexes compared to the number of players, uh, some players may end up with a little more. So players take turns placing one hex at a time face down. In order to place a tile, it has to be placed next to exactly two others. No more, no less. Which can make for some interesting um, map builds. Let's see. Let's see, this is already kind of messed up now. Here. So you end up with something like that. For example, and then uh, now that the, and eventually the planet will be constructed, uh, players will then uh, uh, look at 
uh, their cards and all that, and uh, decide what units to build at the start of the game. You have uh, 20 credits. Uh, credits are tracked with a tracker, which again, I despise the living crap out of trackers. Please, please don't cheap out and you on cheap out on maybe like little cardboard coins or something. Hell, even like well, a cheap paper money thing is a better option. But even sometimes they don't. Some games still don't have enough. Um, the there's one catch to the pre-game spending. You have twenty credit credits to work with, but every credit you don't spend becomes two credits uh, uh, to start with instead uh, uh, for later in the game. So there's that. Um, actual unit costs. Oops. unit cost. Conventional forces are one. Uh, walkers, squadrons are two. Menace are three. Obliterators are four. Artillery is two. And then once everyone's got their starting units, there's the initial drop. Um, players roll off for first placement. Um, Um, when a player goes to place a unit, they choose a, they choose one of their units, they choose a hex in play, and then place the unit there. And the hex is face down when it's turned face up. During the initial drop, a new unit may never be dropped onto a hex that already contains a unit. So, let's say, I want to drop my walkers here. Now, you're, never really not, you're not allowed to drop into a location, so they st start out in the, the terrain outside of New Antioch, for example. Yeah. If the hex has been revealed or destroy the unit, uh, a volcanic hexes destroy conventional units. They are not. They are not equipped to handle stuff like that. Then. And they're destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, terrain in general, um, mountains, um, military units have to stop there. Volcanic, um, it just destroys conventional units, but anything else just has to stop. Yeah. And then eventually, the everyone will have dropped their initial units. Um, but if they have more units, or if they, um, um, yeah, if there's no more places to place units, then they end up in orbit until they can drop, uh, later on. Um. You can also choose not to drop remaining units if you think the terrain is not going to be favorable to you. Uh, and it'll go into the orbit so, uh, side of the reinforcements track. And then the first turn of the game begins. So turn sequence. Increase tensions. So plus two. Draw mission cards. Each player draws a mission. And may buy one extra mission card for five credits. And is there a hand limit? Um, no, but if your player controls Juno platform, they get an additional mission card. And then transit segment, advance all units in transit to the orbit. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Senate phase, console segment. Uh, players will trade their Senate cards um, they have to try to get 10 support in one lobby block or five senators. There's like 10 senators in the game. Two for each of the lobby blocks. 
four different traits, including pacifist, militaristic, isolationist, expansionist. Um, when you trade, you can either request from a certain lobby block um, or request a, scenario, a senator of a specific block or a senator of a certain trade. You're not allowed to request um, a specific um, uh, block senator, trade senator, uh, specific uh, num numbered support. With each trade, each trading player must give the player the requested card and another card from their hand. The writer card, as it's called, is not negotiable. If a player wants to draw more Senate cards, um, they have to raise their hand. And once they raise their hand, they cannot trade anymore. When all players have raised their hand, all players draw another Senate card. Uh, and trading continues until a player declares themselves counsel. So again, 10 support or 5 Senators. When a player declares counsel, all trading must stop. No, no one else is done. Uh, the player that declared counsel. Uh, gets this, which is worth five victory points. That console marker. So as the first player to declare, uh, even if others qualify. Uh, when the console segment ends, all players have to reveal their hands. Now, it's possible for someone to end up with either um, the ill reputation or scandal cards. If you end up with one of them, you're going to be discarding your hand. <laughs> if you have both, you assassinate the console and take the counter from them. <laughs> and then the, those cards get shuffled back into the deck. The planned information leak can be used as a wild one point or uh, can cancel the effects of a no reputation or scandal. I know we had to back in. Immediately after the uh, console has been determined, um, players uh, play mission cards. This is where you now get to play your initiative cards because, again, you'll have the cards you need, uh, Senate wise, to make use of them. Uh, if the order of card play makes a difference, players play in uh, order of priority. says see the priority insert but, yeah oh yeah whenever players go effect uh, first uh, console console is the one who acts first in the priority followed by the player with the lowest total victory from locations uh, and so on and so forth all right once the mission segment is over players must discard down to three senate cards Players already have there are a few fewer need not discard more we'll say uh, for some reason they need to do so so this is like the, the you know the senate step is just or the console segment is just crazy as hell because you got people trading cards like like mad It's, in a way, it's kind of reminds, reminds me of uh, Pit. Anyway. And then there's the action phase, where the player actually moves their, their units and launches attacks. Uh, player action segments occur in priority. With a twist, each player, when their party comes up, they elect to pass for the time being. Um, yeah. Once any player's action saving is finished, the option to go or pass starts over. The players that are already gone uh, are not going to get a second chance to do it. So, starting with the console and going down the list. It's entirely possible for everyone to pass, which leaves the last player in order having to go first. And then they can react. So, first, um, there's movement. Um, Units can move. 
um, based on their movement value. Uh, conventional forces, walkers and menace have uh, two movements and obliterators have one. Artillery has one. So, yeah, as I demonstrated before, so this, going into this would be one, and I'm hoping it's not going to stop my movement. And then uh, that would be two to go in there. Uh, no player can move through an area occupied by units controlled by a faction other than their own. Um, the exception is moving through allies. Uh, even even so, they're not allowed any movement uh, there. And again, moving into the uh, mountains or volcanoes. Yeah, volcanoes. Uh, ends your movement. So if it's a mountain or a volcano occupied by an ally, you're not you're not moving into there. Period. Yeah, and then you have to you have to finish movement with all your units before um, declaring attacks. And no units may end their movement that uh, more than five units exist in the same area. And if that happens, stuff gets removed. So five unit limit per area or location. So I got five in here and five out there. So to declare combat, you declare with your attack arrows. They are placed to the point from attacking its origin to an adjacent area. So there's somebody out there. I want to go send them to fight. Origin and primary attack hex. And it's possible to attack from like um, multiple hexes. Uh, the primary attack hex must contain enemy dependent units. But a breakthrough combat can be declared in the same location even if it has um, no units. So. Do that breakthrough declaration there, I think. Uh, combat's are resolved in any order. Uh, breakthrough combat from a primary attack must be resolved before a new primary attack can begin. So it's attacker, an allies declare artillery support, um, then the defender the, declares artillery support, and then Um, defensive combat roll, offensive combat roll, remove casualties, advance, break the combat. So first, um, artillery. So the way artillery works is, um, can supply support to attacks and defenses up to two areas away from their location. So... One, two. Yeah. And then uh, an artillery unit can only provide support once during an entire action phase. And they cannot fire into an area that's not under attack. They cannot provide defensive support to their own area. Um, an artillery unit under attack, however, does get a one defense value. It can be removed as a defensive casualty. And an artillery unit cannot declare an attack by itself. So it serves as support, but it's otherwise um, kind of useless. Um, then there's defensive combat. So after the artillery support's done, um, So every, so the artillery will provide support dice to this combat. So there's one, two, three, four, five. 
There's five dice uh, from the attack value. Attack values plus support. So the defense. So, so that's what I have for the attack. Let's say my defenders have three defense to work with. They didn't roll uh, anything. <laughs> Every result of six or higher, the attacker must immediately remove an attacking unit. Uh, all units in the primary attack hex are considered attackers. For every result of five, um, the attacker must remove one unit during the move casualty segment later in the combat round. So let's say they roll five. I'm going to have to lose a unit later, but thankfully not right now. And now my surviving units plus my support will roll. And then at fives and sixes will uh, damage defenders. And then the attacking player removes the what he loses for the five. And the, yeah. The defender loses their stuff for their hits. However, there's defensive values in like locations. Um, locations and fortifications um, suck up hits to protect your units. And then, um, yeah. Fortifications also add uh, two dice to the defense roll. So. Building these little fortifications can really help. Yeah, there's only one combat round. And if the defending units are not destroying combat, the attacker cannot advance. And of course, if the attacker couldn't advance, they can't do the breakthrough. Yeah. And then there's, um, oh yeah, breakthrough combat. So after all this is destroyed, um, makes the breakthrough uh, move. There's no additional breakthrough combat sequence after breakthrough combat. Um, Casualties can only be taken through the, the what already participated here, and yeah. Once all the combats are resolved, um, that's pretty much it. Attacks against locations can be especially difficult because of high defense values. So players have another option: uh, lay and siege. Before uh, the beginning of their uh, action segment, a player who controlled the area surrounding a location can, during the movement, declare a location under siege. So attacking and just gets that counter. At the end of the entire next game transaction phase, um, if there's still a control out here, then the counter. Um, is removed, everything here is destroyed, and we take control of the city. Uh, locations that are under siege do not produce resources as normal during the reinforcements phase. They're still added to a player's total for purposes of determining who will get the bishop's grant, and they do provide the controller victory points. And then, after all that crazy action is over, uh, we've got a reinforcement phase. Uh, each player will collect a number of credits equal to their combined resource values of locations. Um, some players may get credits from um, controlling Mars, for example, as well. Um, and then finally, um, 
during the segment, the Bishop's Grant uh, is given to a player who's controlled locations uh, on Thunder's Edge, produce the lowest income. In the event of a tie, uh, it's split as evenly as possible between players um, who are tied, the remainder's not being awarded. So even if you're completely screwed, you get a little bit of extra help. And then you'll get to, to purchase um, new things with them. Um, military units that are purchased are placed face down in the transit box uh, on the reinforcements track. Other counters are placed directly on the Thunder's Edge. They can only be placed in areas where the building player already has at least one unit player present. Uh, recall that a building of fortification requires a sacrifice of a conventional force in the area. So, so first you have to already have the conventional forces there, and then you have to give them up to build that fortification. Player may not sacrifice their last unit in the area to build it, of course. That's, that's dumb. And then finally, also, each player has one other option. Uh, purchase one unit, uh, and only one unit, and place it face down on any single off-world location. These units will contribute to their cost. Uh, their cost has a number of control points to control those locations at the end of the game. They do not contribute their cost to determine control during the game. And, yeah. Only at the end when the victory points are tallied. Players should, of course, note that any units placed this way are unavailable to purchase for the end of the game. So, be careful. And then drop phase. Um, player drop segments... Uh, Yeah. Um, according to priority, priority order. So, we'll take all your orbiting units and place them on the board. No units can ever be dropped in locations, of course. And one unit per area, or if it has a landing zone, uh, three units. Uh, you cannot drop into areas occupied by opponents. They can drop into units controlled. They, they can drop into hexes controlled by uh, other factions, but not which but which are not occupied their, by their units. Because you'll have these control markers to leave behind. You know that you were there. And then, um, again, area limit supply, no more than five units per area. Uh, you're not required to drop all your orbiting units. And in fact, you may be in a situation that you can't. So they'll just remain in orbit until they can drop again. Then, um... After that, it goes back to the, the status phase to to get more attention, more mission cards, and get your units in orbit again, and do all that, all the crazy stuff once more. Game, again, the game ends when uh, someone's got Centaur and through the four other population centers, uh, or attention hits 30. So, at the end of the game, the game is over, and... The players get victory points as follows. Um, before the final calculation is made, the final control of each off-world location is determined. To, to, to do this, each face down counter on each off-world location goes to the player who ha has the most control points there. Uh, control points being the cost of the unit itself. And then, yeah. For end game control, though, each formerly faced down unit, yeah. In addition to strength cards.
there'll be again the strength cards are in the mission deck. Um, so control locations. Um, so like each of these says like various points at the bottom. Um, Centaur very specifically is 13 points. So that's a big jump for anyone who has it. Uh, value of console counters, five points each. And all your initiative cards that you played. So like, uh, for example, this one is like three points. Uh, player's highest uh, points is the winner. Um, there doesn't seem to be a tiebreaker of any kind. But yeah. Um, as with other games like this, diplomacy and trading are a thing. You gotta be willing to talk to your, your fellow players and make deals and, and all that. Um, control of uh, mission cards on occupied areas and credits and whatever mix. Uh, military units cannot be traded. Signed cards cannot be traded outside of the normal console segment. Players can trade promises. <laughs> promises don't have to be kept, of course, but you can trade promises. And yeah, that's pretty much the game. And yeah, that's it. That's Thunder's Edge. It's. I'm sorry that the it's been kind of a cumbersome walk through the the rule book. Um, I wish I'd gotten to play this more before doing this video, but just how it goes sometimes. Why the hell do I like? Do I even like this game? Do I even like this game? It's, yeah, it's, uh, fucking hell. It's an interesting part of Fantasy Flight's history. It's an interesting part of the lore of Twilight Imperium. It's... It's, it's a game. It's a game. Um. It's a game that would benefit from a release with, you know, actual miniatures and actual money counters and, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, what, what, what else do I have to say about this game? Come on, pillar, think, think, pillar, think, uh. Uh, it's just, it's just a weird war game, you know, it's, uh, I've played this once long ago and I still think I, and I know I struggled with that one because that was my early days of gaming when I was young and dumb and my strategies were weird as fuck. Freaking hell. And uh, why did I want this game again? I think I just wanted it for the sake of having it. Uh, it'd be nice to like upgrade this game with like miniatures myself, but I don't know. It's if you like, you know, this kind of planning st strategy and kind of old school combat of chits and dice and it's uh, it's a game <laughs> it's an interesting game but I'm not sure if it's a great game uh, but you never know somebody might think this is like the coolest thing ever somehow. And you know what? More power to them. Thank you very much for watching. Sorry for that. This is a long ass video, but we'll see you next time.